All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. We, that's where Clint left off last week. Uh, and while you're turning over there, let me pray for us this morning before we get into the Scripture. Father, we're just so thankful, again, for this time that you've given us. Lord, we're thankful that we can lift our voices uh, freely this morning and we can truly find freedom in you. And Father, I pray now that as we open up your word, uh, Lord, you'll speak uh, through me uh, and you'll uh, be able to lodge into the hearts this truth that you want us to learn this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, I think I might have gave Trevor verse 10 to start off with, but let's back up to verse 9 if you've got your Bible, and if not, you'll just catch us in verse 10. It says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment unto the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheme about matters of which they are ignorant will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. There are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption." For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Some heavy stuff there. Uh, as Peter is progressing through this book, and, and uh, as we learned over the last few weeks, uh, Peter sets up chapter one, and he's really wanting them to uh, dig into the word themselves, to grow in grace uh, in the pace that God has set themselves with, right? So, uh, and so as Peter is progressing through this book, he now covers a portion of this scripture, and that's what I read to you there, uh, those 12 or 13 verses, where he's talking about the conduct of false prophets. Uh, And this was relevant in Peter's day as well as our modern day, our current day. 
so as Peter is uh, pinning this uh, in Scripture, and we're now able to read this, um, I want us to understand that this, this was something that happened in Peter's day as well as our day. Uh, and as Peter uh, is, is writing this, uh, I like verse 9 because he reminds them before he gets into the conduct of the, the uh, false prophets, that he reminds them that the, uh, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Uh, so that sets up this passage as uh, we go through it. Now, I thought about, uh, I like illustrations, and illustrations sometimes drive, uh, for me, it, it helps uh, sometimes unlock passages. But I was thinking about an experience I had uh, growing up. I was, uh, well, I'd pretty much been grown then. I was 18, and I had a friend of mine that had just turned 16, and for his uh, birthday, he had asked uh, for a 69 Dodge Charger. And not just any 69 Dodge Charger, he wanted one with a 440 engine. Uh, and his mom uh, went ahead and bought that for, <laughs> for him. So uh, they went through uh, the uh, Auto Trader magazine. I don't know if many of you remember that, but... He would pick one up weekly, and he was combing the uh, one ads for this specific car. He wanted uh, this model with that engine. Uh, he, he wasn't real concerned about the, the color, but he wanted that, those things in that car. So he found one, and he bought it. Uh, and I can remember the first day he drove it home, and he drove it in front of our house, and he he kind of revved the engine up a little bit, right? And it kind of got my attention. And I went over and looked at it, and uh, man, he was just glowing. I found my car, I got it, and I kept thinking, even at 18 years old, I'm thinking, this is dangerous. <laughs> this is probably not a good thing that this guy has this high-performance car and he's just barely been driving. But anyhow, we uh, over the course of the week, I got to drive it, and he was... Uh, trying it out, and he, he came over and he said, there's something wrong with this car. Uh, and I'm like, well, what, you know, it sounds really good. I, he's like, it, it just does not perform like it should. I'm like, all right. So like any other tra uh, uh, shade tree mechanic would do, we pop the hood, we're all looking, and I, I'm looking for a vacuum leak or something like that. And it's like, I just tell him, I said, James, this all looks good to me. I don't, I don't know what you're complaining about. So we rode together and he's like, you know, it should have a lot more power than this. So we got a couple more friends together. We're looking at it and it's like, I don't see anything wrong with this car. There's absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, so he changed the plugs and the wires and, and all the normal things you might do to try to get some more uh, power out of an engine. Still nothing. So finally, uh, after about a month of having this car, we called a friend of ours that he was about 10 or 15 years our senior, uh, and he was working for uh, a, a, a dealership in Columbus, and he was a certified mechanic. <clears throat> so he comes out, and we pop the hood, and a, a, the, right off the bat, he knows exactly what's wrong, and he kind of starts chuckling under his breath. And we're like, what did we miss? What's wrong with this car? And he's like, this is not a 440. This is a Canadian block, big block, 318. Total jargon to me. I'm like, I don't know what that means. So I said, Kurt, what are you talking about? And he said, well, basically, you bought a high-performance car, but it's a family car. You're not going to get much power out of this car. It is... It is designed to look the part, but it is not, it's, it's way off the mark. Well, this goes along with our passage this morning because this is what the false teachers uh, were doing and, and still do. They have enough truth that if we don't learn and grow in grace and knowledge in the truth, we'll pop the hood and we'll look and we'll say, hey, everything looks good to me. Why is this not lining up? And it's probably simply 
just not the truth. And so as Peter is uh, kind of unveiling the conduct of these uh, false teachers, uh, he says in verse 10, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. This is part of their conduct. This is how you're going to know that this is a false teacher. They're bold and willful. They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. So I wrote this above that passage. They're driven by the flesh. That, that's what drives this false teaching. Uh, and I think that every one of us, if we would just look at our own lives, uh, this happens when we follow after the flesh, we will follow deception. Something that might look the part, something that might feel the part, is not truly the part. Does that make sense? So this friend of mine that bought this car, he was so excited. And within just a matter of hours, there was disappointment. And this is, this is what happens when we follow after the flesh. It says they're bold and willful. Uh, they, they live uh, for themselves. This is what their, their teaching might be wrapped up in some truth, but what drives their points and what drives their passion is their flesh. So uh, I, I, can, I can say this morning that as we grow in grace and knowledge, uh, God begins a work in our life uh, that is lifelong, right? We talk about that, sanctification. We, uh, as we grow in grace, there's things that he looks on our lives that he wants to add. And, and, and Peter talks about all those characteristics Clint covered a few weeks ago, add to your faith these things, right? And as we do that, and as we apply the word of God to our life, uh, we will begin to recognize uh, things that just don't fit or, or things that just don't line up. Just like a friend of mine, as he, you know, we opened the hood, he knew, and he knew immediately what he was looking at. And he knew immediately, you guys can do everything you can try to do to this car. It's not gonna make it any faster. So as we, uh, as we uh, grow in grace, uh, the flesh is still there, right? And, and we, I think about 1 uh, Corinthians 15, 31, where uh, Paul says that he dies daily. This is not something that once we become and we start adding these uh, uh, virtues and things to our life, that we can kind of let off and, and, and um, relax. We've got to continue striving uh, to be more Christ-like uh, and, and just a great reminder, as Paul says, that he would die daily. This is something that was part of his daily routine to die off to the flesh and allow the spirit uh, more control. Uh, their motivation there is to feed the fleshly desires for power through their influence. And so as, as we uh, uh, look through this and as we go through this passage, It'll become more and more evident as, as Peter reveals things that it is uh, simply not truth uh, and it simply doesn't line up with truth, but as we grow in grace, we'll recognize those things. Second Timothy 3.1, I'd like to read this passage to you. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, and this is kind of Paul's word. And remember, Paul and Peter lived in the same generation. But he says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will, be, there will come times of difficulty. And every time I read that scripture, uh, it stands out to me that that goes uh, completely against our flesh. We don't like it when difficulty comes, right? When struggles come, we want to go the other way. But, but Paul is reminding Timothy, understand this. In the last days, 
will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying his power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So this is kind of Paul's wording of Peter's passage. You know, the t- kind of two go hand in hand. But uh, the way Paul puts it is, I like that verse 7 because he's, they're always learning. They're thirsty for knowledge. But they're never able to come to an understanding of the truth. That's the separation. So uh, they're driven by the flesh. Now, if we go down to, uh, let's start with uh, verse 12 here. And we'll go down to verse 16, but it says, But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast uh, with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. Speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So I wrote this above that passage of willingly forsaking the truth. It's, it's purposeful. It's done on purpose. It's not something that they're just ignorant of. As they are driven by the flesh, they allow the instinct of the flesh to take control. Uh, when I was 12, 13, something like that, uh, my brother was working for a, a tree trimming uh, a, a friend of his own. And uh, one Saturday, they, they uh, chopped a tree down that had a raccoon nest in it. Uh, and when the tree hit the ground, <clears throat> they didn't realize it had a raccoon nest in it until it hit the ground. And they went over and looked, and there was actually a baby raccoon there. It looked to be a three, it still had its eyes closed, uh, about three days old. Uh, but there was no sign of the mother. So my brother took it and nursed it uh, with a bottle. Uh, and when it got about six weeks old, he gave it to me. He's like, here's a raccoon. This is a unique pet. But he, he said this to me, and I can remember him saying this to me. He's like, this is a wild animal. And you need to get it fixed because once it goes into heat, you will understand how a wild animal acts. Well, like any good younger brother does, you completely ignore what the older brother says, right? It's like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. I got all the answers. So I started uh, forming a really big bond on this animal. This uh, raccoon would climb all over uh, my back and around, uh, just an inseparable bond for about two months. I'd walk it around with a leash. Um, I would fish at ponds and I would uh, bring home the fish and this raccoon knew exactly what to do with this fish. Now keep in mind it was three days old when we got possession of this, right? Right? But this, this raccoon would take the fish, literally scale the fish, and then eat it. No one taught it how to do this. It just understood how to do it out of its instinct. 
And I can remember as a kid, literally just in all of this wild animal. And I was able to be a participant in this thing's life. And it was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And so uh, my brother and I were going to go uh, away on a, a fishing trip in Canada. And before we went, about, a we- about a two or three days before we left, she went into heat. And I know that she went into heat because when I walked out to the pen that morning, she didn't greet me with the same happy-go-lucky attitude. So we had a, a, there was a box inside of her cage, and that's, I guess, what a raccoon likes is that dark um, kind of safety. I couldn't see her eyes. I couldn't see where she was at. But as I got closer to that pen, she let me know she was there. She was angry, she was hissing, and I'm thinking, what in the world is going on, right? And so um, I did the best I could to feed her and things like that. Uh, and while we were gone, I told my dad, can you help me feed this thing while I'm gone? And he was like, I don't want no part of this. This thing is going to literally hurt somebody. But because... I was his son and he was my dad. I asked him, come on, if you can just do this for me, I think if we can get her through this part, she will, she'll turn back to the same happy-go-lucky self she was in, right? And I'm sure my dad was thinking, this guy has no idea what he's talking about, but he, he agreed to it. And about the second day he was feeding her, uh, as he got his arm in there, she got a hold of him. And that was the end of the pet raccoon. (laughs) He just let her go. And I say that because this is exactly what Peter is talking about. But he says, but these, these false teachers, they're like irrational animals. They're creatures of instinct. And, And I'm sure you guys have all watched shows about people that have wild animals and they pet them. And because of my experience as a child, I'm thinking, you don't know what you're petting, right? This thing is, it's a wild animal. And, and it will act in instinct. It's just the way that God has created it, right? It's born to be caught and destroyed. Uh, they said blaspheming about matters of which uh, they are ignorant. So the, these false prophets, they willingly forsake the truth. Why? It's not because they want to deny the truth. It's because their flesh does not want the truth. And that's what drives them to forsake the truth, to willingly forsake it. It says they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, their blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. You can, you can understand kind of the mind of Peter when he's actually witnessed false teachers and he knows that they're false teachers and yet they're around these folks and they're feasting with them, they're having a great time with them. And, and Peter's, just, he's saying, they're like irrational wild animals. They're, they're living by the flesh. It says they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. That word insatiable there means it's impossible to please. And I understood at 12 years old when I thought I had everything under control with this pet raccoon that I had, I realized really quick that it had an insatiable desire that it was following, that it had no plans for me. Made it very plain, right? But at first, it was playful, it was cuddly, it was just so fun. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. I want you to just think about that word insatiable, impossible to please. And I think when you have someone that's driven by the flesh, 
that they willingly forsake the truth. This is what they're, they're following after. It's an insatiable desire that they will never satisfy. And this is, this is Peter trying to get his readers to understand this is the conduct of a, the false teachers. This is the template they follow. It says here, uh, they've, they've got hearts trained in greed, accursed children. They've forsaken the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor. And I can remember as a kid, this was probably one of my favorite stories that was ever told to me because it was like, this is so far out that a guy was trying to uh, go talk to a king uh, of Moab and, and God stopped him in his tracks through a, an angel. He couldn't see the angel. However, the uh, donkey wouldn't go any further. He was beating the donkey and what did the donkey do? It started talking. I mean, I can remember thinking as a kid, this can't be real, right? This can't be true. I've never heard a donkey talk, right? But God was trying to get the attention of Balaam. And, and, and the great thing that I think, and I've, I've, I've come to embrace this with God, is he's got laws and forces in place uh, that he has set in motion. But at any time, he can stop in and stop that. I'm reminded when he was on the boat with his disciples and the winds and the waves were just crushing their boat. And he simply just said a few words, peace be still. And it was like perfect weather, perfect time to be on the water. The, wa the waves stopped. You think about the force of nature, and we've seen this on TV. Maybe some of you have even uh, witnessed that and experienced that. It is just not something to uh, contend with. Yet we serve a God that is be above all that. He is sovereign over all that. And at any time, he can step in, right? He has that power. And this is a reminder in this story of Balaam that he steps in and he gives this donkey the ability to speak. And I don't know about you, but if, if I'm... Trying to, uh, and it says here, uh, he's uh, followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Now, this was what was happening. The king of, Moab, uh, the, uh, the, king of the Moabites, his name was Balak. Uh, and he was, he was concerned and, 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 and afraid that the Israelites were going to come in and take his country, Right? He understood that they were close. They were going to overtake him. And so he goes to, Balak goes to Balaam, and he was a soothsayer, and he goes to Balaam and he asked him, he said, can you curse Israel? Can you, can you curse them for me? He, he was trying anything and everything to stop them from overtaking his land. And Balaam agreed for a reward, I'll do this, but I need compensated. And, and the king of Moab, Moabites, he agreed to it. However, what happens in this story is as he goes, and, and this, is, uh, this is what sometimes is confused. What was taught to me as a kid was once the talking donkey comes to play, that's as far as the story goes, and it's far from over. Because what happens is when when uh, Balaam is going to curse Israel and God stops uh, that uh, donkey in its tracks and it speaks to Balaam, Balaam is still undeterred. However, when he gets to the mountain to curse Israel, he blesses them three times. Now, as Paul Harvey says, this is the rest of the story. It doesn't stop there. God intervened and he, and, 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 and he blessed. But what happened was Balaam was so driven with greed. And for that reward, what he did was he came up with another plan. And he told 
uh, Balak that if he could uh, get the, uh, uh, entice the nation of Israel uh, with idolatry and prostitution, that he would, uh, God would pronounce judgment on Israel. And, and actually through that, he succeeded. 24,000 people lost their lives in Israel. Balaam succeeded. He got his reward that he was after. You see, he was driven by the flesh. He willingly forsook the truth. There was one thing on his mind that was driving him, and that was to get the money, right? But you would think, and every time I read that story, you'd think a talking donkey would have woke him up. I mean, it's the most bizarre, yeah. One of, the, one of the most unique stories you'll read about in Scripture. And, and I think about, uh, we, we talk all the time about our dog and, you know, way spoiled, you know. But when we get food, she's constantly wanting more, wanting more, wanting more. It's an insatiable desire for her. She never gets enough. But what we talk about is, what would happen if she could talk to us? Actually form words. I think one of the girls maybe mentioned that a while back. And I said, you wouldn't want to know. I'm glad she can't talk. She would, that, that would ratchet it up at just a whole nother level, right? But you would think God intervening and allowing this donkey to talk would have, would have pulled back the reins of Balaam and said, I'm, I'm dealing with things that are much more greater than me. This money doesn't mean much. I'm going to let it go. But it was an insatiable desire, that insatiable sin. It was, it was, um, it, it could not be, um, the, the, the thirst could not be quenched for that. And then the last point that I've got this morning, I wrote this above verses 17 through 19. Let me read that to you. These were waterless springs in midst, driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for speaking loud boasts of folly. They entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. I wrote this above that passage. They're prisoners of their own greed. You remember when John, in John chapter 4, when Jesus uh, meets this woman at the well, he begins that conversation with her. You remember what he specifically tells her about the water that she was drawing out of that well, you'll thirst again. The water that you draw out of this well, it'll only last for, it's just a temporary satisf satisfaction and it's gone. It, it'll never satisfy you completely. But he says this in, in verse 14, let me read that to you. But whosoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It's a stark difference. This insatiable sin that it's impossible to satisfy, that uh, these false teachers were driven by the flesh and they were willingly forsaken this truth, the itch that they are trying to Satisfy never satisfies. However, in contrast, Jesus says the water that I'll give you will become in you a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It, it, it gives the picture of true refreshment. And when someone has experienced true refreshment in their life, uh, Jesus has come in and, and given them freedom then they understand truly what freedom is. 
we shouldn't be trying to find freedom. And it, and it, I, I like watching shows about Alaska and Connie, you know, that yeah, last week we were helping my mom clear some trees and I was in the corner resting and she kind of chuckled and she said, I told your niece that you're wanting to go to Alaska and start a homestead and you're having trouble clearing this little bit of branches, right? She, that was kind of a poke from my wife, like, that this is a pipe dream here. This is not re- reality, right? But I enjoy watching that, those shows. But what drives most of these people that go to these places, these remote places, is they want freedom. They want to live life their way on their time when they want to do things, right? This is, I'm on my schedule doing things my way when I want to do them. That's not true freedom. Because what Peter says here, and I like what he, we, what he mentions here at the end of verse 19, for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And that's something really good for us to just kind of tuck in the back of our mind and really think about and do some self-reflection and say, Am I really searching after freedom? Or should I really just be finding my master? See, that, that's, we shouldn't be trying to find freedom, but finding our master. And, and those of us that know Jesus Christ, he is our master. He gives us what this passage in John, when he talks to the woman at the well, every one of us here that knows Jesus Christ as our personal savior, we've experienced that refreshing well of water that is springing up in us daily uh, and gives us that eternal hope. That is true refreshment. Now, I'm still, and, and I'm, I'm reminded of some of the ways that Paul starts a lot of his, his uh, books, his epistles, a servant of Jesus Christ. He, he found true freedom but he wasn't finding freedom in his flesh. He was finding freedom in Christ, but recognizing that he truly wasn't free. It was just he knew who his master was. And I think probably something really good for us just to really think about, what am I overcome by? Because what this passage says, whatever a person's overcome by, to that's he enslaved. My prayer this morning, and I pray that you're overcome by the Spirit. And you can say like the Apostle Paul, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. To that, I'm I'm enslaved. And to that, uh, there's, there's true freedom in that. When we, when we look over this passage, we think, well, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of negativity that, that goes on in this chapter too. When Clint and I were, were dividing the book up and, and discussing, he's like, I'm gonna apologize in, in the future what you gotta cover, right? It's a lot, there's, this is a lot of stuff, right? It's, it's, it's heavy. But just because something is, is uh, negative or uh, serious, it should stress the more importance. Right? So as, as Peter stressed in the first chapter, growing in grace and knowledge, that's the key to discovering the conduct of the, the false teachers of our day. There's a lot of guys out there that are driving around in 69 Dodge Chargers, but they're not authentic. You get what I'm saying? They say they got the keys and this is a high-performance machine. It'll really set you free. And then truly what they're selling you is just shackling you to something of the flesh. True freedom is found only in Jesus Christ. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, as we bow again, uh, bow in your presence. Father, we thank you for your word and, and how it means, uh, how it projects truth into our life, uh, how that it 
shows our shortcomings, how that it shows where uh, we might be falling short, uh, where we might be selling short in areas. And Lord, I pray as we've looked over this passage and as we stay diligent in our Christian walk, uh, may we be able to show those around us uh, not a waterless spring, something that is just large and deep but is empty. But Lord, we can show them a true spring of water welling up in our life, that eternal hope that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray now as we sing this closing song, Lord, may our life bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray these things, amen.